we do have quite a number of individuals that are registered. Uh, we will get started, however. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Serene Wilkie, and on behalf of everyone at Investors Community Bank, we would like to just take a moment to uh, welcome you to this event. Uh, we know that everybody is very interested in learning more about the Paycheck Protection Program and the forgiveness aspect. So, so for the last two months now, we've really been committed to helping small businesses like yourself to obtain these loans. And so far, we've been able to disperse more than 850 loans totaling over $105 million. And these funds went to our local communities and helped protect more than 14,000 paychecks so far. And we're going to continue to accept new loan applications until the funds in the Paycheck Protection Program are exhausted. Uh, as of last night, there was still more than $150 billion available in funding. Um, so you're likely joining us today because you want to learn more about how you can ensure that your loan gets fully forgiven. And today's pr presentation is really to review the information that we have as of today, Thursday, May 21st. And after this next hour, our hope is really that you feel more confident and well positioned to eliminate most, if not all of the debt that you've incurred with the loan that you received from us. And we're also gonna cover how to document your files and how investors is gonna help you through the next steps in this forgiveness process. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, before we get started, we, like I mentioned, we are expecting um, over 350 participants were registered for this call. So it's a very um, popular topic and on um, everyone's minds these days. So we'll just remain in silent uh, listen only mode. However, the session is going to be recorded and will be made available to those who registered after the event is, is closed. And then we're also, um, we've taken some time to proactively collect questions from you in advance so that our panelists could be prepared to address most, if not all of those questions during today's presentation. And then what we're gonna do is, if time permits towards the end of the presentation, uh, we're going to open it up for additional questions that you might have. And so you'll notice on the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer widget button. And some of you have already uh, been able to locate that so far. And I'm going to be fielding some of those questions near the end of today's session, in addition to a number of other questions that we've received. And we'll do our best to get through as many of these questions as possible today. So. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Dave Coggins with us. He is our Executive Vice President and Chief Banking Officer. And also we have Carl Spey. Carl is the Assistant Vice President and Business Credit Manager, and both have been very actively involved with the teams responsible for managing the Paycheck Protection Program here at Investors Community Bank. And both have spent countless hours studying the guidance provided so far. So Dave, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Thank you, Serene, and welcome all of our customers and friends that have been on this journey with us as we've been rolling out the Paycheck Protection Program. I'd have to say, as a career banker, this has been one of the most interesting, um, exciting, and frustrating programs that I've ever had a chance to be a part of. And we're hoping today we can help, as Serene mentioned, help you navigate this next important phase of this program. Next slide, please. We need to put our famous disclaimer on the front end. <clears throat> We're doing our very best as an agent of the SBA to um, give you the best information we have available to us and help you interpret that. We understand that each one of you must provide your own certification of the information contained in your application, but we're here to try to help you get as much um, of the debt forgiven as we possibly can within the rules. Next. Some issues to keep in mind as we go through today's presentation. Number one, I'd have to say there's been more than enough experts, as I put in quotes, out there helping us interpret these rules. A lot of people, we're getting emails daily with different experts across the country providing their interpretation. Ultimately, as our customer, it's our job to help get your application through 
this next phase, and that's uh, what we're uh, working hard to uh, get ready to do. We're obligated um, as an agent of the SBA to verify and evaluate the accuracy and completeness of your application. SBA has given us a very important role in this process. We don't expect to be surprised if a number of our customers tell us about their cousin Ricky that got their debt forgiven in a way that was different than they did and why did we not allow something that um, cousin Ricky got done? Well, we're doing the job that we feel um, responsible for doing and doing it to the best of our ability. Um, but we really do want to help you get the maximum amount of forgiveness allowed by the rules. And these rules are complex. I'll be the first to admit, we're trying to help make them more understandable. I've been living these rules uh, since April 3rd and really particularly on this forgiveness part since Friday night when the final details of the forgiveness portion of this program were released. And they're not, something that you can um, absorb in the first reading. So they take a lot of time and we realize we're trying to help you shortcut some of the understanding of that. Uh, one thing to also keep in mind that I think has tripped some people up as they've been thinking about this phase of the program, the rules for determining the loan amount are clearly different than the rules used in determining forgiveness. One important thing to keep in mind is when you were applying for your loan, you took the amount of payroll only. There were no other non-payroll expenses considered in that, um, in that math calculation. You basically took two and a half months worth of 2019's payroll, and that's what you got for a loan amount. However, in the in the debt forgiveness portion of this program, as you paid that money out, you only have eight weeks to pay that payroll out. And so, and therefore the other, the rest of the, the money that you got is to be used for other non-payroll expenses. And we'll describe that in more detail as we go through the presentation today. One thing I would note is there have been a lot of conversations in the press and out there in the marketplace about possible further changes to this program. Obviously, this program has been changing throughout the process. We've had to live with that. We've had to make determinations along the way that were based on incomplete information. We were able to make those de determinations with, um, um, with good judgment. And fortunately, we either guessed or kind of knew um, right almost all the time, and that's um, worked to our advantage when we get to this phase. But it's possible that Congress will see fit to make changes. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about whether or not uh, the SBA gave you enough time to pay out your, your um, funds. Um, eight weeks isn't very long. And um, so there's some of that conversation, and there's other conversations that are uh, being bantied about in Congress about ways to improve the program now that it's almost over. Um, so that's just life in the um, regulatory world that we all need to be prepared for. Um, next. One thing that I just like to highlight, this got a lot of attention a couple of weeks ago when everybody was being made to wonder if they were gonna be found to have not needed this money, and therefore, if they didn't certify in good faith, was the SBA gonna come after them and, and audit them, et cetera, et cetera. Fortunately, um, anybody that got less than $2 million worth of PPP funds was given an assurance that that certification was done in good faith, and they're not gonna be second guessed by the SBA on it. Um, Fraud's another matter, but that particular issue received a lot of attention and uh, you were given a pass and, and a safe harbor on that if, um, or, or uh, you don't have to worry about it, bottom line. But I did wanna put it on here to remind you that that is something that those getting more than 2 million have to, have to check that box on the application and it's pretty, 
clear that SBA plans to audit those, um, those customers. Next. An important concept that received a lot of attention. It, it was the basis of a lot of your questions that we got in advance. This whole business of the covered period, the eight weeks, the 56 days starting when you received your funds. And I'm gonna just use a little example here of why this became an issue. People were trying to time their loan closing to match up with their payroll because they weren't sure they were gonna be able to get enough of their payroll expenses in the eight weeks. So here's, here's the example. You got your funds. The earliest that any of our customers got funds were on, was on April 4th, the day after the program opened up. And we did have a number of customers that, that were able to get their loans through by then. So the covered period is essentially that date, April 4th, and then fit, roll ahead 56 days, that puts you to April or May 30th. That's your covered period. Next slide. The SBA, to try to solve this problem, came up with the concept of an alternative covered period. And you see that scattered throughout the guidance in the application. It's an administrative convenience for borrowers with semi-monthly payroll or, or um, bi-weekly payroll where you can't get it to match up. In this example, you got your funds on the 4th of April. However, your semi-monthly payroll, twice a month payroll, was, came out on April 1st. So if you fast forward, excuse me, 56 days from there, you'll find that you're gonna run out of days before you get your fourth payroll period. So the concept of an alternative covered period allows you to pick the first day after you got the money that you have a payroll, which in this case is April 15th. And so you roll ahead uh, uh, 56 days from there, you clearly get the fourth payroll within that alternative covered period. So depending on your circumstances, when your payrolls are issued, um, that gives you cover for that particular issue that was a big concern in the early going. Next. Another issue that got a lot of attention and was a source of a number of the questions that we received is this issue of cost paid versus cost incurred. Our costs paid are when the checks are distributed, payroll checks, non-payroll checks, et cetera. That one's plain, simple, cash basis, et cetera. Costs incurred, however, is when the pay or the expenses are earned. So when the pay is earned, um, you can see that the payroll costs then need to be paid on or before the next payroll date. So it isn't a true accrual where you might be accruing over a long period of time for various reasons. It's basically you pick one or the other, costs paid or costs incurred. And on the non-payroll costs, it must be paid by the next billing cycle. So we'll get into some details on this, things like um, health insurance. A lot of questions about, you know, we pay our health insurance once a year, so then we accrue it. Does that count? We don't think so. It's got to be, it, it seems clear that the costs must be paid during the covered period or they must be, they can be incurred and then paid before the next payroll date or on or before the next payroll date or on or before the next billing cycle. So you've just got a little bit of leeway there, but it's not a full accrual that, you know, typical accrual accounting. Um, helps you deal with. Next slide. So what are the eligible payroll costs? Well, they include, number one, cash compensation, which plain and simple, gross wages, salary, gross tips, keep in mind it's gross. So in other words, the withholding that you pull out for the employees, that's included here. Um, gross commissions, vacation, leave, any separation pay. And a big question that a lot of people had is the issue of bonuses. Say you wanna do some kind of a bonus, um, hazard pay as some people have called it, or something to help retain employees during these difficult times. 
those bonuses, if they're paid during the covered period, they can count as cash compensation. Now for my farm and ag friends out there, uh, one of the questions that we got was, what about commodity wages, which is a common way that um, some farm um, expense or compensation is paid. Uh, we don't see any way to make that work here. It needs to be cash and you need to be able to prove it with, uh, as Carl will talk about in your uh, checkbook or other form of, of verification. And it's hard to prove um, commodity wages. Um, another important note is you can't get debt forgiven for more than $15,385 for any one employee. Now, why is that odd number important? Well, if you do the math for anybody that got more than $100,000 in compensation and you divide that by 12 and multiply that number by two and a half, which is the math of the loan determination, um, I'm sorry, if you take the eight weeks, divide it by 52 weeks, and take that times 100,000, that gives you 15,385. So that's why that particular number is important. You can't get any de debt forgiven for more than am that amount for any one employee. Another form of payroll costs would be the employer share of health insurance premiums. I already talked about some of the issues there with if you pay those premiums once a year, um, you're going to have a problem with this one unless you can get your insurance company to somehow give you a monthly bill that you can pay. Um, that's, that one, it's got to be cash paid for those premiums and you got to be able to prove that you paid it during the covered period. And employer contributions to employee retirement plans, same rules. So a lot of times some of those expenses are paid once a year. You've got to pay them during that covered period. And then employer paid state and local taxes assist on employee compensation. That's unemployment insurance. Um, one thing that um, has been asked about in a number of questions, it's the whole question of vision and dental. There's nothing in the guidance, nothing in the application, nothing in the instructions that give any reference to anything other than health insurance premiums. We think that's pretty clear. There's been speculation out there that vision and dental are a form of health insurance, therefore they should be covered, but we don't see guidance that gives leeway for that determination. We think it's clearly just health insurance, not vision and dental. Again, these costs can be paid or incurred as talked about previously. An important uh, part of the rules say at least 75% of the funds received from PPP must be used for eligible payroll costs. The other, up to the other 25% can be used for other non-payroll costs, which are covered in the next slide. Next. Non-payroll costs. Um, the first one, interest on debt obligations secured by business assets. Unfortunately, in the guidance, it talks about obligate mortgage obligations secured by real or personal property. A lot of people think of mortgages as real estate only, and they think about debt, uh, the other types of obligations um, on equipment, things like that, as other secured debt. We think it's pretty clear that the interpretation should be interest on debt obligations, secured debt obligations, secured by business assets. So that means things like secured lines of credit and equipment loans and things like that are, are can be included here, but not things like credit card debt or accounts payable that are collecting interest, things like that. It's got to be secured obligations. Um, and it's important to note that, that those debts have to be uh, originated and in place prior to February 15th of 2020. So you're going to have to supply verification of that. And Carl get in, will get into that when he talks about some of the documentation. A second one is the covered rent obligations or lease obligations for real or personal property. Same thing, the lease has to be documented. 
you're going to have to supply a copy of it and it has to have been executed prior to February 15th. Some questions were asked about whether or not a non, I mean a related party lease is eligible. We don't see anything that would prevent it as long as there's a clear and valid lease that was in place prior to, to February 15th um, that's um, not a that's that's documented like a, a normal lease obligation, not on a napkin or anything like that. And then the the third thing that you can use for non-payroll costs would be utilities. And utilities are defined as electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, and internet. A few things to note about this. Nowhere in the guidance does it define transportation. Is that trucking your product? from your shop, your, your manufacturing floor to the warehouse? Is it trucking milk uh, from the farm to the cheese factory? Is it, is it employees driving um, back and forth between two farms or, or two places of business? It doesn't define it. And um, we think it's reasonable to take the position that any transportation costs that you would normally deduct on your um, income and expense for tax purposes and call transportation. Uh, we think that that's legitimate transportation for this purpose. Um, the other thing that often many of you get a bill that has a bunch of services like phone, internet, cable, et cetera, all bundled. Um, how do you handle that? Well, cable isn't included, but internet is. Maybe you get your internet through your cable provider. So we think you're gonna to have to provide bills there to verify that you're using it for um, valid expenses. Nothing in here speaks to sewer and garbage disposal. So that's, that's a missing piece. We don't know if there's any way to include that. We haven't seen that. So we think those, those are not anticipated to be included. And again, this can be paid or incurred during the covered period. The alternative covered period doesn't apply to these expenses. It only applies to payroll because that was designed to help with this payroll problem that I described early on. So don't get those two mixed up. The non-payroll is strictly during the covered period, 56 days after you received your funds. Next. Some reductions in forgiveness amount. That's kind of a nasty sounding term. There are some things in the law, in the rules that say you can't get forgiven debt for certain situations. And one of those is if you took employees that were making less than $100,000 and reduced their salary by more than 25% of the covered period or alternative covered period, compared to what they were getting back sometime between January 1 of 2020 and March 31 of 2020, the amount over 25% that you reduce their salary is not eligible. You're not eligible for debt forgiveness for that amount. So there's a way in the, in the application that that gets reduced from your debt forgiveness. There is a safe harbor that's allowed if you reduce the salary and you restored it by June 30th. The tricky part is that you got to make sure that you also paid at least 75% of your funds for payroll costs. So there's, a, there's some things that you have to look at, two rules in tandem to make sure that you're not uh, violating one or the other because they depend on one another. So that amount greater than 25% must be taken off the forgiveness amount. Next. Another interesting concept is that of the FTE or full-time equivalent reduction quotient. Um, what that simply is, is that you use the average full-time equivalents, which is basically what's a full-time employee during the covered period or alternative covered period and divide it by one of two reference periods. And those two reference periods below, you'll see I've got them um, highlighted there. The, one of them that you can pick from is, is February 15th of 2019 to June 30th of two, uh, 2019, or you can pick January 1 of this year through 
February 29th of this year. So it's your choice, but whatever reference period you take, you divide the FTEs during the covered period by that reference period. And that gives you a number that's gonna be, if it's one or greater, you're fine. That means that you didn't reduce your FTEs um, at all. It's basically this, it's, it's either the same or greater than it was back um, at one of those reference periods. If it's less than one, you have to apply that result, 0.90 or something like that, against the payroll forgiveness amount, and you're going to get a reduction in your payroll um, or in your debt forgiveness by that amount. Now, one thing to note that was um, asked in a lot of, of the questions, what's an FTE time frame? What's a full work week? What's a full-time equivalent? Well, it's a 40-hour week. Some of you might have a 32-hour week, work week is a full considered full-time for benefits purposes. For purposes of PPP, it's got to be a 40-hour week uh, for them to count as a full-time employee. And the maximum is one uh, full-time equivalent per employee, even if you got somebody that's working 60 hours a week. And you can use a simplified method if you if it works to your advantage, where you have any full-time employee is 1.0. FTEs and everybody else is a half. So you do the math and figure out if you if you do better using that method than you do any other method. Next. There, there's some safe harbor conditions. You see safe harbor scattered throughout the rules on this particular program. Um, but if you reduce your employee levels from February 15th of this year to um, April 26th, um, and you and you restored your FTEs by June 30th to levels in the pay period that includes to um, February 15th, your FTE reduction quotient doesn't apply. So that's the way you get around that if you had to reduce your employee levels. The thing that I would caution you to think about, however, is that you've got the safe harbor for the FTE reduction quotient, but you've also got to make sure that if you've reduced employee levels significantly, you've got to be able to spend all of your eight weeks worth of PPP loan amount on legitimate payroll expenses and non-payroll expenses in the proportion 75-25. So you've got to, again, be able to work both tests to make sure that you can get full debt forgiveness. Uh, there is an FTE, FTE reduction exception. We like exceptions to this kind of rule. If you made a good faith written offer to rehire and it was rejected, has to be rejected in writing, um, or your employees during the covered period were either fired for cause, voluntarily resigned, or voluntarily requested and received an hour reduction. There you can get an FTE reduction exception as well to this uh, quotient. Compensation replacement. A number of you, these there were a lot of questions on this issue. You've got a number of you were owner employees, uh, self-employed individuals, general partners, and you got uh, a PP lo PPP loan based on your 2019 um, self-employment income. So how do you replace that? Well, basically you need to pay yourself and show evidence of that. And I know some of you are worried about the checking account implications of that. If you've only got one checking account, how do you deal with that? You've got to show evidence that you paid yourself the portion that you're eligible for, the 850 seconds of 2019 compensation, self-employment compensation, either from the Schedule C, if you're a business, Schedule F, if you're a farm. And if you do the math, you know that 850 seconds of that isn't going to get you the full amount of your loan forgiven just for that. So 
if there's employees, same rules as above, but you can use the rest of it for non-payroll costs, same as above, if these costs have been in the 2019 Schedule C or F. So if you've got interest payments, um, you've got utility costs, and I know some of you might have a problem with this if you don't have any other business expenses that aren't in a separate entity. So this one might take a little work to make sure that you get the maximum amount of compensation of debt forgiveness for your self-employed um, uh, borrowers. Next slide. One other last thing that I'd like to just highlight, the SBA EIDL loan. That, there's been a lot of publicity around that. This is a program for economic injury disaster loans. Um, you apply for these directly with the SBA, your bank is not involved in those, but you have to indicate on your application for debt forgiveness, whether or not you received one. And you have to indicate whether you received an advance, which is simply a grant. If you got one of these, you know, an amount of money up to $10,000 just suddenly appeared in your checking account. However, an advance grant will reduce the amount of your loan forgiveness by the amount of the advance. So if you got a $10,000 advance on this EIDL program, you are going to have your PPP debt forgiveness amount reduced by that $10,000. So you can't, you can't have both. And uh, that's something that I don't know how many people connected the dots on those two things. But if you got a $100,000 PPP loan, and a $10,000 advance on an EIDL loan, you're gonna get 90,000 of your loan forgiven. The other 10 is either gonna to have to be paid back or it's gonna get amortized at the end of, this, of the six months worth of, of deferral and you're gonna to have to pay it back that way. So just something to keep in mind that's in the application and it's gonna be um, an important thing to point out and to um, document. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Carl Spey, who's gonna walk through some other phases of the program. Carl? Thank you, Dave, and good afternoon to our participants. Uh, some things that I'm gonna to cover today are documentation that you're gonna to need to provide along with the forgiveness application, some things that Investors Community Bank is gonna be doing to help you through the process. We understand that this is a very complex um, program with a lot of nuance and a lot of documentation. Um, so there's going to be some some steps that we're taking to help you through that process. And then uh, to go through some documentation that you'll want to retain for your files that you didn't necessarily have to provide the bank with your applications. So first I'll go through the eligible payroll costs. As, as Dave mentioned, um, for payroll purposes, there's two time frames, either the covered period or the alternative covered period. Um, and you're really gonna need to provide two sets of payroll documentation. The first one is going to be that reference period. Um, so the, the thing, the time period that you are comparing your current staffing levels to for the FTE comparison. So if you are a non-seasonal borrower, which many of you were, that reference period, as Dave mentioned, is either February of 2019 through June of 2019 or January and February of 2020. For seasonal borrowers, it could be the same, those same two time frames, or any consecutive 12-week period between May and September of last year. Depending on staffing levels, um, with seasonal summer businesses, it may be beneficial for you to choose a different time period than the two um, January through uh, January through February of this year or February through June of last year. Um, in addition to documentation for the reference period, you'll also have to provide documentation for the covered period. What's that look like? So it's going to be a payroll file. If you work with a third party payroll system such as ADP, they'll be able to generate a master payroll file for you that details all of the individual employees 
as well as the gross compensation for each of those employees during the covered period. Or you could, pro you could provide bank statements uh, that would document that same expenses during that time frame. In addition to that, you'll have to provide tax forms uh, that overlap the covered period. And we'll go over that on the next slide. And you'll also have to provide account statements, uh, receipts, canceled checks, or some type of documentation to show uh, payment for employee benefits, such as employer re retirement contributions and the employer portion of the health insurance contributions. Next slide, please. So the tax forms, uh, if you're a business, a nonprofit, or a self-employed individual with employees, that will be the second quarter 941. Um, in addition to any state unemployment insurance reporting or the SUDA. If you're a farm, we understand that you file 943s and only on an annual basis. So your application will be supported with that payroll file that I mentioned earlier with the state unemployment insurance reporting. Uh, one thing to note for self-employed independent contractors, you will need to include the 2019 Schedule C or F, which you also provided with the loan origination application. Next slide. In addition to the payroll costs, as Dave mentioned, there's the eligible non-payroll costs. So this is the insurance, or sorry, excuse me, the interest, um, the lease payments and utility payments. So for the interest payments, it has to be on a loan that was in place prior to February 15th of 2020. So in order to provide documentation, it's going to be an account statement for February 2020. All account statements for the covered period in addition to one month after the covered period. Uh, key item to note, and a lot of questions that we had received is, uh, can you prepay, uh, can you prepay the loan payments? And that is not eligible. It has to be uh, on the normal uh, scheduled, the required payment um, schedule with those loans. And that's really what those uh, statements are gonna be for. As Dave mentioned with the rent or lease payments, uh, we feel, fairly confident that related party rents are going to be eligible. However, it needs to be on a documented lease and that lease has to have been in place prior to February 15th of 2020. Um, a lot of the related party leases that we see are either old or maybe the rents have been adjusted since that lease was originally written but that it's our understanding based on the guidance that we have available today that the, the lease is going to be what uh, decides the amount that's eligible for forgiveness for that component. In addition to the lease, it will be uh, some type of documentation supporting the payment. So whether that's canceled checks, uh, a bank statement, or uh, some type of statement that shows the amount that was paid during the covered period. Next slide. Utility payments, as Dave said, a lot of these come bundled in with your phone, your internet, your TV, uh, things like that. Some type of documentation uh, for the invoice or a bill uh, to show that it was in place prior to February 15th of 2020, and then documentation to show when the, when the amount was paid during the covered period. This could be, again, copies of checks, uh, the account statements, or a bank statement showing that transaction was made. Next slide. So that's the documentation that you need to provide along with your forgiveness application, but there is also documentation that you need to keep for your records. So this would be all of the documentation that was provided to the bank with the origination application. So that application, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, is gonna say SBA form 2483. 
and all of the documentation that you provided with the origination application, um, the payroll files, the 941s, the 943s, things of that nature. And then as we get to this phase, it's the forgiveness application, and that'll say in the bottom left-hand corner, the SBA form 3508, as well as the supporting documentation uh, that we were, that I just went over. In addition to the documentation that you provided to the bank, there'll be things that you'll wanna keep for your file. Um, there may be work papers or calculations that you made to help you determine your original loan amount um, or documentation showing any individual employees who received compensation in excess of 100,000. Or as Dave mentioned in that FTE safe harbor um, component, if you had employees that you had to furlough or terminate and you made job offers to them, written job offers, and they declined, uh, again, get it in writing, having all of that in an HR, an HR type file that will help you um, document that you made a good faith written offer and it was refused and uh, it is not subject to the FT reduction component there. So our recommendation is that you keep all of this in one file and uh, there's been guidance from the SBA to retain it for at least six years. Next slide, please. So that's all the documentation and it's a lot and there's a lot of different dates and components and numbers. Um, what I'm gonna go through now is how ICB is going to be uh, helping through this process, um, simplifying it where we can. So we're partnering with a software provider that uh, we actually worked with previously and it went very smoothly. Um, so we don't anticipate any issues there. Uh, one of the things that they're gonna require is uh, the tax ID number. So if, if you applied as a business um, or as a self-employed individual with an EIN, inputting that information and then uh, if you applied as an individual with your social, putting your social in there, and the SBA loan number. The SBA loan number can be found on your loan documentation that you received when the loan was originated. Next slide, please. Once you input those two data points, it'll bring up uh, a series of different numbers, and it's looking for you to verify your loan amount that you received to make sure that you're you and no one else is trying to access your information uh, without your knowledge. Next slide. Doing so, once you create um, the login information, it's gonna pre-fill a lot of the uh, document, a lot of the data fields for you so you don't have to go back and, and retype. Um, so I, I, as I said, we're trying to make it as simple as we can uh, throughout this process because it's very uh, complex and can, can be confusing. Next slide. So this is where you would go through and either enter your information or if you had already filled out the 508, the uh, forgiveness application, you would have the ability to upload that. Next slide. And then it will walk you through the different eligible costs that you would enter these inf enter the information into these boxes. Next slide. And you would enter, again, the information regarding the FTEs. Next slide. And here's where you would upload your documents. So uh, you don't have to email them back and forth and maybe they get caught in a spam filter or a size limit on the email. You'd be able to upload all of your documents securely and encrypted so they come directly to us. Uh, and just kind of helps with the paper shuffle that way. Next slide. So based on all that information that you had entered through the previous, um, the previous pages, it will um, calculate, it will run the calculations for you and give an estimated forgiveness amount. 
and then you'd submit the application. It would come to us for review. As Dave said when he started the presentation, it's um, our obligation to review the documentation, um, both for the SBA and for you. Uh, on the origination side, we were reviewing applications and in some cases found um, errors or, or miscalculations that were both in your favor or out of your favor. Um, and so we understand this is a very complex process and we're trying to help you out where we can and our goal is to get as much as we can forgiven within the rules. Uh, next slide. All right, thanks a lot for that information, Carl and, and Dave. At this time, we have a, a little less than uh, 15 minutes left and we'd like to get through many of the questions that um, have been coming in through the session. Um, I'm doing my best to try to combine. There's some that are on the same type of topic. And so I thought I would start with a couple of questions for, for both Dave and Carl. Um, one of the questions is related to the timing. There's a, 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 several questions regarding the covered period and the alternative covered period. And one question, a couple of questions that are related to that topic are, does the loan have a better chance of being forgiven if the application for forgiveness is submitted as soon as the covered period over is over with, or if it's applied for at a later date? And so can you talk a little bit about the timing again as to when would be ideal for someone to submit their application for forgiveness? I'll take the first shot and Carl might have more to add, but <clears throat> first of all, that's kind of could be even a political question, depending on whether or not Congress tinkers with this program. And um, we think that if they do and you submitted your application early, too early, we think you'll get the benefit of the changes. If they benefit you, you might get the penalty if they don't. But um, there's a couple things Carl mentioned that are, help drive that. Number one is the covered period, but you may be in a situation where you'll need to wait till after June 30th if you furloughed employees and brought them back. And then the other thing that was an important thing to think about in Carl's part of the uh, presentation was the whole issue of having documentation for the month following the covered period to be able to verify some things. So. Um, trying to, to get a jump on this, we don't think is to your advantage. You might want to wait a little bit, make sure you've got all your documentation. We've got 60 days to make our determination as to whether or not the forgiveness amount is correct. And then SBA has up to 90 days after that. We don't think either party is going to use all their time. There's no benefit to doing that, but you can see that the time could be a ways down the road before you get final approval of your application. So yeah, we understand there's anxiety about making sure that you know whether or not you're gonna get your full amount of your debt forgiven, but we also wanna make sure we get it right. Carl, anything to add? I would add that yes. the during the origination phase, there was, especially the first round, there was a lot of concern of when the, the funding would run out. So to apply early and get the application in the process as soon as you can. The money has already been allocated, so there's not necessarily that same sense of urgency on the forgiveness side, because it's not we're not facing the same type of deadlines. So as Dave mentioned, depending on your particular situation, it may be beneficial to wait until after June 30th if you have to bring staff back online. And also we have the requirement of uh, providing statements for the month following the covered period, uh, which of course you have to wait to be able to do that. And I'll just add to the software solution that Carl demonstrated with those few screenshots. We would hope to have that up and running uh, by the 1st of June as well. And one, one of the nice things about it is you can start your application process, get as much of it completed, upload your documentation, you can save it, you can close it, you can revisit it, and you can you know take your time working through the application process, and then you can submit it when you feel like that you're ready for that. 
Um, another question that came in too is related to timing is, is, and you might've touched on this, but is the question was, is there a deadline and when we need to file the documentation um, to get the amount forgiven? And Carl didn't reference that there isn't really a deadline. Um, We've yeah. seen no deadline. There's probably a practical deadline at some point here where you get, you're facing the amortization starting because it hasn't been forgiven. It would get real messy to not know before your six months is up, but we haven't seen any deadline that you have to apply for the forgiveness or the, or you forfeit your right to forgiveness. I don't know if you've seen anything like that, Carl, but I have not. No, I haven't. Okay, another question uh, is related to the alternative payroll date and the alternative covered period. Is that the date that you use for rent and utility payments or do you use the date that the money was deposited in your account for the payments to be um, forgiven? Yeah, the, the covered period is what you have to use for the non-payroll costs. For the payroll costs, you can use either the covered period, which is 56 days after you, from the date you received your funds, you have that amount of time to spend the um, non-payroll costs, but then you can use the alternative covered period for payroll costs, but you can't use the covered, the alternative covered period for non-payroll costs. So there's some confusion over whether PPP is for two months or is it two and a half months? And so the, the, there's a difference between the calculations and maybe you can just describe that. With the forgiveness is based off of payroll expenses in the covered period, but the original loan was determined to be approved based on a two and a half month, if I remember correctly. That is correct. And that is a, a common source of confusion because you got more um, in loan amount than your payroll would allow you to spend during the eight weeks if your payroll is essentially the same one year to year. Um, so that's where the other non-payroll costs come into play. And that's why you have up to 25% of your loan amount to spend on non payroll expenses, but it's easy to get confused between those two. And the non-payroll costs have had nothing to do with how you got your loan amount calculation um, validated. It, it didn't come into the picture on the loan uh, origination side. It just comes into play in the loan, in the debt forgiveness and how you paid the money out. And one thing I wanted to add that I meant to mention earlier, a lot of people got some guidance regarding uh, setting, putting these funds into a separate um, checking account set up just for this purpose. Some accountants were advising that, and we understand why they might have wanted you to do that, and maybe it makes it easier for you, but it does not um, cause you to, or not have to, it doesn't give you a pass on documenting how you spent the money and providing verification of how you spent the money. So whether the money is commingled with the rest of your checking account or in a separate PPP only a checking account, the obligation for documentation and support is the same either way. So I'm not sure you get a lot of benefit from having that separate account that you might have been advised to open, might make it easier for you, but it doesn't give you a pass on this phase of the debt forgiveness part. So we only have a, a couple of minutes left. I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple of additional quick questions here. Um, one is related to transportation costs, is vehicle gas included in that? And I think we confirmed that the transportation co uh, category is a little gray, right, Dave? Hold on, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we think anything that would typically be considered transportation for purposes of your accounting records and your tax records could probably be a case made for them to be included, but it's just not clear. Are Uber rides um, eligible? Are, you know, all those kind of things, uh, fuel oil for the farm, uh, you know, the tractor out in the field, is that transportation? 
we don't think so. But as Serene said, it's been one of the under guided uh, points in the program. All right, one additional question that there's several questions regarding this is related to the 941s for the second quarter. Um, some are inquiring, should we wait until July to get that second quarter 941 or should we go ahead and submit uh, the application for forgiveness right away? The, the guidance in the application uh, specifically states providing the tax records to or the the tax records that you would report your payroll expenses on during the covered period. And since that would be the second quarter 941 and you have to provide that with the application, um, it may be best to wait until you have all of that together and submit it as one file. We don't have to play a, a back and forth. Okay. Um, another quick question I think we can answer uh, is what about ex expenses that were incurred due to COVID, um, such as purchasing uh, personal protection equipment? Are any of those classified as eligible expenses for this loan? Not that we can find. Um, there's nothing in the guidance that speaks to that. In the original CARES Act, there was a place where it talked about other. It was kind of a catch all. Nobody ever defined what could be included in other. Uh, we think it was there to give the SBA administrator and the Treasury Secretary some degree of flexibility, but it was not defined in the, at this phase of the application development or the instruction. So we would have a hard time justifying that be included unless we got some further guidance that, that said specifically that was allowed. Okay, so I think for uh, we're coming up to the hour and there are many, many questions and we understand that everybody is going to be um, having their own unique circumstances. We find it might be likely that we will continue with a series of these webinars as more information is provided on the Paycheck Protection Program forgiveness process. Uh, we want to, um, we'll also plan to answer all of the specific questions raised uh, both prior to and uh, during the registration, we got several questions, some that have been answered, and I, there are several questions in queue that we won't have time to get to, but we will make sure that we track all of those questions and reach out to you either individually or through a frequently asked question reference document that we'll publish to our website. So keep an eye on our website for updates. We're also sending regular email communications. Um, our contact information, is um, available on the slide that you're noticing on your screen. We will make these materials available to everybody. There's some questions being asked. Are these slides going to be uh, provided to everyone? We will provide these materials, the recording and the questions and answers that we're preparing to everybody who is, is registered. And we just wanna make sure that um, everybody understands we're here to support you through this process. We realize it might be a little overwhelming, perhaps complex. And our software program will get us part there to, to make this easy. Um, but we are always here. Uh, you can contact us directly with any specific questions or concerns. So we'd just like to take some time to, to thank you for uh, taking time out of your day today to attend today's session and watch for, for further, further communications.